Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UNSW Disability Innovation Institute's webinar, Making Perfect People, Prenatal Genetic Screening and a Legacy of Eugenics, presented by Professor Jackie Leach Scully. My name is Catherine McKay. I'm a lecturer in bioethics at Sydney Health Ethics, part of the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. And I have four duties to perform here uh, before we get started. My first duty is the acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the Betagal people of the Eora Nation who are the traditional custodians of the unceded land on which UNSW Kensington campus sits and the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of the University of Sydney Camperdown campus, which is the land that I'm joining you from and the land upon which I live and work. I pay my respects to elders past and present. I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today and give you a warm welcome. As we share our knowledge and practices across our communities, we also recognize the knowledge practices and experience embedded within Aboriginal custodianship of country. So that's my first duty completed. Second, a little bit of administration. First, if audience members have any questions throughout this event, or if anyone is having any difficulty and can't use the Q&A function, please email us at diiu at unsw.edu.au. Closed captions have been enabled on otter.ai and via the Zoom live transcription. Please contact us if you're unable to access these. Um, please note that we have two Auslan interpreters from Sweeney Interpreters with us today who will be on screen alongside the speakers. And the audience Q&A will be conducted via the, Q, the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you're on a web browser or on a mobile device. Please post your questions there and they'll be passed on during the Q&A session. You'll also be able to raise your hand to ask a question during that time. Second task completed. Now to the third, which is to introduce the DAIIU to you. The UNSW Disability Innovation Institute is a world first initiative focusing on disability research, education and knowledge exchange. Its team members take pride in undertaking work that is radically inclusive and crosses disciplinary boundaries. The Institute's approach is to see disability not as a problem to be solved, but as an integral part of the human condition to be encountered and engaged with rather than feared. In this light, I'm delighted to be sharing this webinar, the sixth and final in a series of events focused on the topic, a past still present, disability discrimination and eugenics from the Nazi Third Reich to COVID-19. The aim of this series of seminars is not simply to consider these as historical events that appear to us today so shocking, but also um, safely set way back in a history that we can confidently leave behind and say never again. We want to also consider whether this is a past that's still present. Um, that is whether these ideas still influence attitudes to people with disability today. So that's my third task completed. Now it is my great pleasure as my final duty to introduce um, our presenter. Professor Jackie Leach Scully is an internationally recognized bioethicist specializing in disability and feminist bioethics. With a background in molecular biology and further training in neurobiology, she held research fellowships at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and the University of Basel, Switzerland, before helping to establish the first interdisciplinary unit for bioethics at the University of Basel. In 2006, she joined Newcastle University in the UK as senior lecturer, becoming the director of research and ultimately executive director of the Policy, Ethics and Life Sciences Research Centre, also known as PEELS. In August 2019, she moved to UNSW as Professor of Bioethics and the Director of the UNSW Disability Innovation Institute. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Jackie. Welcome and thank you for speaking to us. Thank you, Kate. And um, I'm, I'm in the odd position now of having introduced all the previous webinars uh, and now being the person giving uh, this, like this final one. So it, it's odd, but also pleasant. Uh, I'm going to attempt to share my screen now and check out with people that they are actually seeing the right thing. Okay, how is that? Okay, that's good. Right, thank you. 
So, as you've just heard in this series of webinars, um, the question we've been asking ourselves is whether and to what extent the history of eugenics has left any kind of legacy in contemporary attitudes towards people with disability. And one of the key areas where this comes up, of course, is in connection with prenatal testing or prenatal screening to identify an impairment that may affect the future baby. Increasingly, that is genetic screening. So the question I'm asking is whether doing this is eugenic. So bioethics, which is what the, uh, the area that I work in, um, considers the ethical issues raised by life science knowledge arising out of the implementation of scientific knowledge, but also um, arising out of the effect of scientific knowledge on our thinking. Um, so there's, there's a massive bioethical literature examining the ethics of prenatal testing and screening, and I will come on to that shortly. What I want to highlight here is that bioethics engagement with disability um, goes beyond prenatal screening. In fact, you could say that disability is a sort of central concept, an organizing concept for bioethics, because a lot of medicine is about the prevention in one way or another of disability or chronic illness. But the relationship between bioethics and disability is a fraught and complex one. Um, and as the Finnish bioethicist uh, Simo Vemus uh, once said, or back in 2003 um, said, that it's been traditionally focused on killing, which is a blunt way of saying it's been traditionally focused on the beginning of life uh, and end of life issues to do with disability. And here's an outline of what I'm going to try to do today. Um, go briefly through the methods of prenatal identification of anomaly that we have today and glance at the standard ethical critiques that there are of that. I'm going to look particularly at the disability critique because one arm of that is about um, eugenics. And then I'm going to focus most of the talk on the discontinuities and continuities that there are between um, what I'm going to call old style eugenics and prenatal, let's call them selection technologies of various kind. And then ultimately come to some kind of answer on to the question of whether prenatal screening and, and testing and selection are eugenic. So I think we're all familiar with the way that since the 1970s there's been a kind of successive introduction of a range of different methods to identify the presence prenatally of developmental disability or abnormality. I'm not going to go through all of those because the, the traditional methods at least are, are very familiar. It's useful to note that the term screening is generally used for population-based methods um, the methods that are simple and cheap enough to incorporate into routine antenatal care. And that's why we're all very familiar, I think, with things like ultrasound scanning and the triple blood test, which have been around uh, for a while. Prenatal testing or diagnosis tends to be more targeted. It's almost always these days genetic. And it's done either to confirm a screening result that generally isn't you know, totally accurate, um, or where there's already enough of a family history of some kind of genetic condition that the chances of a fetus being affected uh, is particularly high. More recently, um, there have been a number of developments in prenatal identification. Um, these include pre-implantation genetic testing or PGT, um, which has been around since about 1990. And that's uh, where IVF in vitro fertilization is combined with genetic testing. So in vitro produced embryos are genetically tested. Um, and then depending on what the finding is, some are selected for transfer. PGT is often considered to be um, kind of ethically less difficult, not completely unproblematic, but ethically less difficult because it doesn't involve a decision about termination of an affected fetus, uh, a termination of a pregnancy. It involves deciding whether or not or which embryos are going to be um, transferred back to the mother's uterus and turn into a baby shouldn't have done that, sorry. Reproductive um, genetic carrier screening or RGCS uh, has come along um, quite relatively recently. Um, 
it's the genetic testing of a couple who may or may not have any kind of symptom or history in the family, um, usually before pregnancy or sometimes in early pregnancy. Again, to see if they're carrying a recessive uh, gene for a condition and then depending on the result of that, decide whether to go ahead with a pregnancy or continue with an existing pregnancy um, or not. Non-invasive prenatal testing or screening, NIPT or sometimes NIPS, um, is probably the most recent of these developments. Um, it involves testing fetal cells that are floating around within the blood of a pregnant woman, uh, which um, before the technology became available, it would, wasn't possible to, to isolate those fetal cells, but now it's possible to do that. And in that way, you can test the DNA of uh, the fetus to find out what's going on in it genetically. Um, and the advantage of that, at least technically, is that uh, it's considered to be non-invasive. It's minimally invasive. You have to take blood from the mother, um, but that's just a, st a standard blood test. Um, it's not involving something like amniocentesis or any of the more risky um, screening or testing technologies. Um, and so it's simple, it's fast, it's cheap, it's pretty safe, and it's becoming um, very increasingly popular and increasingly in demand as a way of doing prenatal screening. Now, the, the accumulation of this vast amount of genetic info that's coming along uh, and technological advances that mean that you can do things like instead of screening, uh, testing rather for one or two genes at a time, you can screen test for hundreds, maybe thousands of genes all at once. And that's increasing our ability to identify genes that are linked with disabling conditions. It's important to emphasize though that although we might have a link, it's usually only a statistical link. So we don't often have a causal connection. We don't know exactly how the gene or a mut mutant version of a gene might cause that condition. This, the genetic information and the technological advances mean that in the future, prenatal testing is likely to be applied to, to test the screen for more putatively disabling conditions, meaning that more and more people are going to be identified as having some kind of genetic issue or even impairment, even if there's little or no physical effect on those people. And the associated um, commercialization and potential autom automation of, of testing raise some obvious ethical issues. And I'll be commenting a little more uh, about that um, later on. So in the last 50 years since prenatal testing arrived, um, bioethics has identified a number of what I'm going to call standard ethical issues. These include things like the moral weight of the decision about whether or not to terminate the pregnancy or not. They include issues of defining the moral and legal limits to testing, limits to termination, and that provides the, in a sense, the parameters for the utility of testing, because at least from a health economist point of view, there's no point in testing if you're not actually going to act on that test. And that raises the question of judging whether the issue or the condition is serious enough to warrant testing in the first place. The questions of testing feeding into the potential commodification and instrumentalization of reproduction. And there are also very banal issues to do with access, but still important issues to do with access to services, ensuring that everybody who wants access to those services can have them. And all of these arguments have been very well rehearsed in any number of articles and books, etc. The disability critique of prenatal testing and selection has some, stand, um, some features, distinctive features, that are not found in the standard arguments. And these include things like um, prenatal selection discriminates against disabled people, that it doesn't in, in reality um, enhance people's reproductive autonomy or their capacity to determine how their lives go, to make free choices, and that it expresses a kind of hostile or harmful attitude towards people with disability. And that's a so-called expressivist argument. And I'm not really going to touch on any of those in any detail um, today. I'm going to focus on the fourth um, 
of the distinctive disability critiques, which is that prenatal selection is in fact um, eugenic. Now, if you've been um, with us through the uh, through the rest of the well, series of, this, of, of webinars, you don't need me to go through the history of eugenic ideas in any detail. But for any of you who haven't been through those, here's a very brief summary. We understand eugenics to be the idea that it's possible to improve in some way the quality, in inverted commas there, of populations by influencing heredity, um, by manipulating who reproduces, what kind of people are born uh, and which kind of people are able to reproduce. In the 19th and early 20th century, this meant encouraging those people considered to have better heredity to, to have more children. And it's important, I think, to note that however we feel about these ideas now, and however problematic um, terms like quality and you know, better and so on, improving uh, the population, they were widely popular at the time, um, not just in Germany, which is the country we often think of, but throughout Europe, North America, Australia, and so on. Um, and they were seen as progressive ideas. They were seen as ways in which to help a suffering population. The explicit rationale that was given was also almost always to avoid the economic burden on a society uh, that would come from having more scare, uh, scare quotes again, inferior people uh, around. I want to emphasize that this old style eugenics was taken up with enthusiasm within that very specific social and cultural context. Now, some of you would have seen these kind of images before. This is from uh, the Nazi Third Reich in, um, in, in Germany in the middle of the last century. And it was emphasizing how much more a genetically um, ill person, an Erbkranke, cost the state than a, a nice, healthy nuclear family over there on the right. Um, but in case we think that it is just about Germany, here's also um, a poster from Britain at about the same time about the importance of um, releasing the stranglehold of hereditary disease and unfitness uh, on, on the population. So this was um, a, a totally eugenic um, idea. And this old style eugenics developed from a very specific um, context, as I've said, from a world that was undergoing massive material, uh, technological and cultural change. And what these ideas suggested was the realization or the hope that science could help bring this rapidly changing, rapidly transforming world um, under control. These, these ideas come from um, the knowledge of evolution and also early um, genetic knowledge in which it was appealing to people to think that social problems like you know, poverty, unemployment, et cetera, et cetera, uh, were under, could be brought under scientific control, that they were genetic hereditary and could therefore be managed with um, as, as science became more powerful. Um, it's also worth remembering that at the time, eugenic ideas weren't applied to people with disability alone, though that's how we tend to think of them now again, but also to racial and cultural groups, to working class people, um, the poor in the colonial context, to indigenous populations as well, uh, and so on. And even if you haven't been um, attending our series of webinars, uh, we, we all know where this kind of ended. Uh, earlier webinars in the series went uh, into more detail. Um, here's the personal memory that I have. Um, I've mentioned to some people before now that I spent some period of my life living in Dresden uh, in Germany, which is near Pirna. And Pirna is a town on the Elbe where one of the clinics is a picture of it, a clinic called Sonnenstein, uh, which was where um, some of the many hundred thousands of people, disabled people and people with mental illness and mental health issues uh, were killed. And this is one of one of those clinics. Um, many of them were killed in this gas chamber. This has now been turned into a, a memorial at the clinic, which um, we visited. Uh, and totaling uh, around approximately um, 
15,000 people. And as you can see from this, which is part of the memorial and numbers, some of those um, children and adults who were murdered in Sonnenstein. Some people today compare prenatal selective technologies explicitly with that all-star eugenics um, in terms of the rationale, i.e. The, the eugenic ideas that are still perpetuated, or in terms of the impact and whether the impact of um, prenatal selection is uh, eugenic. And here, you know, a few examples of some recent papers um, discussing in different ways that possibility. I want to look at some of the what I've called the continuities and the discontinuities between old style eugenics and prenatal selective uh, te te uh, technologies. There are, I think, discontinuities in things like the overt aim, the scientific context, the social and political context, and the process. And I'm going to run through those in the next few minutes. So one of the key discontinuities is in the aim, or at least the overtly stated aim. So it's not overtly aimed, prenatal um, selection is not overtly aimed at shaping the gene pool or shaping human society. The goal that's always stated is to improve the lives of individuals and the lives of couples. And they to do that through avoiding the suffering that's assumed to come along with particular genetic conditions and disabilities, and also by increasing reproductive autonomy. So allowing individuals and couples to control their reproduction and make decisions about not just how often or how many or if at all they want to have children, but what kind of children they want to have. So to increase parental choice, based on the ethical principle of reproductive autonomy and the idea that more autonomy is almost necessarily a good thing. Um, it's worth bearing in mind though that there could be hidden um, aims for doing this, either uh, perhaps also a, a foreseeable side effect, which is not the stated goal, but which we all know is under there, underneath there somewhere, or it could even be an un unconscious goal um, to do something like population engineering, but it's certainly not the overt aim. The second discontinuity um, is about the scientific context, which is very different. There have been major changes in our understanding of genetics, and what will now what now seems to us to be very um, very crude, very basic ideas about genetics are what nineteenth and twentieth century eugenics relied on. The ideas about how genes control characteristics, um, how those characteristics and those genes are uh, transmitted, um, the role of non-genetic factors and whether those characteristics or conditions appear at all was it has become infinitely more complex. I also want to add a little bracket here and say that always happens so that I, in something like 50 years of time, people are going to look back at our current genetic knowledge and say that was really crude and really simplistic too. So we need to you know, keep that in mind when we make our judgments about the past. Um, we accept now, I think, that prenatal genetic identification or prediction can be reasonably accurate on a family level, much less so on a societal level. And so we are much more um, modest or cautious about the impact that anything like a, a prenatal selection um, as a policy can have on the uh, beyond the family, on society as a whole. Another big discontinuity is in the, um, the political and the social and the, the cultural context. So that mass murder of people with disability under the Third Reich was one key factor that contributed to the, the post-war um, revolution and ideas about human rights, the introduction of the Universal Declaration uh, of Human Rights, um, the entrenchment of civil and political rights in international law, all through the second half of the 20th century, leading um, obviously and eventually to the crafting of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is now um, 15 years old. So even acknowledging that the operationalization, the actual realization of um, 
claimed disability rights is a very different thing in real life and often and very often fall short and very often inadequate. Even acknowledging that we know that we live in a very difficult different political and legal context into which people with disability are born uh, today. In the middle of the 20th century, there were no things, such things as disability rights, and we didn't discuss things as, even as universal human rights. Second, the, there have been major cultural shifts since the 1960s in how societies like Australia and others manage or uh, accept difference. There's a recognition now, I think, that um, diversity, difference and diversity is generally valuable to, to society rather than the opposite, rather than a liability. And so we, we acknowledge the importance of including diversity within society and sometimes diversity that extends as far as disability. Thirdly, since the 1970s, you can see we're moving through the latter half of the 20th century there. Since the 19th century, we have moved away from a view of disability as being a medical pathology, or at least purely a medical pathology. And in what now come under a sort of umbrella, umbrella heading of social models or social slash with relational models of disability, we generally now understand disability as a complex um, outcome of uh, a relational interaction between a, a mismatch between some kinds of body and mind and their environments. Now, having that more nuanced view of where disability comes from, I think necessarily affects what kind of intervention we think is necessary or whether an intervention is necessary at all um, into, into disability. And finally, there's a major discontinuity, of course, in the process of these interventions. Um, they're not state mandated. Um, there is the overwhelming rhetoric, um, the overt statement about choice, about prenatal selection as being entirely voluntary, about increase, the, the aim of it being to increase um, the individual or the couple's capacity for self-determination and hence the importance of information about the condition to ensure that the, the decision that people make uh, around whether or not to continue a pregnancy in the presence of uh, detected anomaly um, is, is, is seen as crucial and increasingly I should add what's seen as important is the is information and direct um, knowledge from people with lived experience of that particular disability, if the individual couple concerned are unfamiliar with that disability, to be able to talk to people who have got experience and uh, understand um, what kind of life can be led with that, because very often it's a better quality of life than people imagine it might be. There is also um, increasing increasingly consumer or market driven um, technologies and, and and kind of this ties in with that, that issue about the provision of information because although um, an increasing availability of some uh, testing technologies through through the market if it's not state provided can be seen as increasing choice I think we have to be it wouldn't be being overly cynical to uh, recognize that um, most commercial companies uh, are not going to be providing a lot of information that puts people off using their products. So their publicity is going to be pretty much about the the moral new neutrality and the usefulness of the uh, of prenatal selection. Against that, I think we have to note that the availability of prenatal interventions, just the availability, even if they're not um, mandated by the state and even if they're not even provided by the state, that does have an, an expressive effect. It means that prenatal selection is legitimated by the state because it's permitted. The routinization of testing in, in antenatal care, the fact that it's part of the antenatal care conveyor belt, 
obviously changes the context within which prenatal testing decisions are made. It's much harder to step off that conveyor belt than to choose to step on it, which is one reason why feminist bioethicists since the 1970s have been questioning how free the apparently free choice is. With the uptake of screening becoming an indicator in a way that you are a responsible citizen and also a responsible parent, societal pressure to conform with that environment in the decisions that you make, I think can, is arguably as strong as any kind of state compulsion. Way back in 1994, the um, bioethicist Arthur Kaplan uh, in an interview said, in this country, he was talking about America, but it's more general, I think, eugenics isn't going to come from a Hitlerian dictator saying, you must do this. It's probably going to come from a society saying, you can have a kid like that if you want, but I'm not paying for it. And I think that's something we have to take perhaps uh, more seriously than we have done. So, I conclude that there are significant discontinuities between old style eugenics and contemporary prenatal selection in a way that makes it, I think, impossible to argue that they're directly the same. We can consider the issue um, in another way and ask about the effect over 50-ish years of prenatal selection. Has it actually had a eugenic impact? Well, looking at the evidence, I don't think there is any evidence that it's had a genetic impact. There's no evidence that in the populations that use it, gen genetic diversity has sort of um, decreased. Some people, many people have expressed concerns, not about general genetic uh, loss of diversity, but the impact on specific conditions. For example, the, the example which is often used is the apparent eradication of Down syndrome in some countries. And Iceland is uh, the kind of uh, the anti-poster child, if you like, here for that one with claims that um, Down syndrome has been pretty much eradicated um, by the uptake of prenatal testing and termination in, in Iceland. I think in reality, the data are rather more complex. Um, Iceland has a tiny population, therefore it never had a huge number of children being born with Down syndrome. And in fact, the number of children born with Down syndrome in Iceland is still about in the same ratio, given its small population, as, as happens in Australia, which has a much larger population. So it's hard to see exactly what's happening there. And there's also often um, a lot of variation in between test, the rate of test uptake and the rate of termination. And so um, the examples I've got there, Denmark has a very high rate of test uptake and rate, a high rate of termination for Down syndrome, whereas the Netherlands has a relatively low rate of test uptake, but those people who do take it up um, have an equally high rate of termination choice. So the data are more muddy than we might think. You could also ask, does prenatal selection, has prenatal selection sort of promoted eugenic thinking? And here I think the data are more ambiguous. I would be less um, clear about, dis not exactly dismissing them, but saying that they're not conclusive. And it's a, it's a question I want to park for a moment and then come back to um, in a second. So we could we've reached this point and say prenatal selection isn't old style eugenics. That's what I'm claiming. Does that mean everything's OK? I would not surprise you that my answer there is, well, no. There are two things I want to, to highlight. One is that the environment within which reproductive choices are made um, is not the same as it was um, 70 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. It constantly changes and it, ch it changes. It doesn't stay static. It changes with advances in screening technologies and other kind of technologies, you know, still to be imagined, still to come, and changes in the policy that affect it. I think a particular concern that I have at the moment is the way that what you might call the industrialization of genomics um, is, is affecting things like routinization. Um, which lowers the threshold for use. As I've said, it becomes easier to go with the routine than step off it. And the alternatives to making particular kinds of decisions become less obvious. There's the magnification of, of scale 
and of speed, where previously we were talking about testing for uh, one or two conditions, and it would take quite a, a while to get those, those answers. With things like multi-gene panels, we're now talking, as I said, about hundreds or possibly thousands of genes done very, very speedily. And all of that, I think, decreases both the scale and the time, decreases the potential for genuine uh, choice. And remember that the key feature, or one of the key features, distinguishing prenatal selection from old-style eugenics is the capacity for free choice. You might need to get a little bit more sceptical about what's happening in the industrialization of genomics there. I think we also have to accept that prenatal selection policy contributes to the kind of societal norms that frame the sorts of decisions that people make, even if those decisions are apparently, apparently free. So decisions about which genetic tests are going to be on those multi-gene panels define the parameters of what's seen to be um, the normal body and the normal behavior and also normal kinds of choice. So one e example with which many of you will be familiar that um, condi conditions uh, of, of deafness, genetically related deafness, which don't come as part of a more complex syndrome, but are pretty much purely about deafness, um, kind of jump on and off the prenatal selection panels. Uh, as people say, uh, people decide, Deafness is um, is a genetic condition that people might want to avoid. It's a severe disabling condition we want to have to be able to test against it. And then other people say, no, it's not. It's it's a bit of a predicament, but it's not a severe disability. It doesn't warrant testing and termination options. Let's take it off again. And we, we see a recurring pattern of, of those of genes for deafness going on and off uh, availability for testing. And I'm pretty sure that in the future, there will be more and more as our genetic knowledge becomes more complex and more subtle. The second point I want to make is goes back to that question of continuity with old star eugenics. I said that I thought that there were more discontinuities than continuities in part because and one of the reasons I said that is because prenatal selection is a classic example of what you'd call an overdetermined practice. That is, there are many more than one reasons why it's available. Any one of those reasons, or and why people choose to make use of it, any one of those reasons would be enough to as an explanation. But there are in fact multiple reasons. So. Prenatal selection as a policy is provided for reasons that reflect, for example, um, respect for autonomy. They also reflect the desire to prevent suffering um, and, and disadvantage that comes or may come from disability. Most of us here, I think, would think those are good reasons. Um, they reflect also concerns about the economics of public health and social care. Some of us would think that that's a very grey reason indeed. But I think they also reflect fear and revulsion and hostility towards people with disability and prejudices and assumptions about quality of life, all of which I think, and I hope most people here agree with me, are not um, good reasons for providing that. And disentangling what exactly is going on at any one point is, um, is, a, is a tricky one. So the question, is prenatal selection eugenic? Um, is, is perhaps a less useful question uh, than a less useful question than to ask why do we suspect that it might be? Because the answer to that second question is, is because we all know at some level that those those negative emotions and those negative attitudes haven't actually gone completely away. They are there, I would argue, as an undercurrent throughout our thinking. We need to be aware of it. So. There is a continuity, I conclude, there is a continuity with um, past eugenic thinking, but it's more to do with the underpinning impulses uh, that made eugenic um, actions seem reasonable uh, at the time. And so the task for us um, at the moment is, I think, to try to see where those, um, those contaminating um, attitudes continue to, to to play out. 
I think we, we need to be careful about using words like eugenic because it's become something like an eugenic has become as a term an, an alternative for just it's bad for disabled people. As we've seen, not everything about prenatal selection can easily be labelled eugenic and not everything that's bad for disabled people is eugenic. Sometimes it's just plain old disabilism, uh, which is all by itself bad enough. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll look forward to um, a conversation continuing and your questions and comments. Thank you very much, Jackie. So as I said before um, Jackie's talk, if you have questions, you can use the Q&A function, which if you're on a, a desktop or a mobile device is at the bottom of your screen. You can also raise your hand um, and your questions will be um, fed through. So I do have one to start off. Um, this is from Jennifer Smith. Is there any social caution expressed in the costs of undertaking prenatal testing, et cetera? i.e. are such tests readily available and within economic reach for most people? Yeah. Sorry, could you read that one again? I'm, I missed part of it. Yeah, sure. Is there any societal caution expressed in the costs of undertaking prenatal testing and that kind of thing? Are such tests readily available and within economic reach for most people? Um, yeah, I mean, the answer to that is very much that it varies. Uh, depending on, on the country uh, and what is actually what is generally provided um, as part of, say, a state provision or with subsidised provision and so on. Um, for example, in, yeah, in the United Kingdom under the NHS, a lot of testing uh, of particular conditions um, is free of charge and you know, free at the point of delivery. Um, in some places, NIPT is, some places it isn't. I think I understand that in Australia, NIPT is generally not available under Medicare, but it's uh, something that has to be paid for privately. There are issues there about equality of, of access. And I, I kind of, if the question is about, um, in a sense, enforcing caution by making it expensive, um, financially costly, I, I would argue that's really not the way to do it. Um, if it's, I think they're kind of enforcing that there are costs, but they're not necessarily economic costs. And I think that part of the impact of routinization is to, um, is to perhaps distract attention from some of those uh, emotional and other costs. Now that's far from arguing that people, you know, it's good for people to be upset and to suffer. But I think it we, would we, we need a, a sort of broader framework, a broader network of discussion for people who are in a position or maybe um, deciding whether or not to enter into um, pregnancy about what the implications of testing uh, might be. Um, one of the difficulties I find in practice is that testing is often offered not as um, being away finding out if there is a problem, but as a reassurance, it's presented to um, the mother uh, or to the couple uh, as being, this is going to reassure you that your, that your baby is okay. And from the clinical point of view, it's actually not about that at all. It's finding out whether there's something uh, at issue. Uh, and that disconnect, I think, is often problematic. It's not problematic when there is no issue. It's problematic when uh, the two suddenly come up against each other uh, and the mother or the couple have to move from reassurance to something else. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a next question from Ainsley Newson. Um, she says, thank you for a wonderful and clear presentation, Jackie. I wonder what need you see which actors' voices should be heard here and how? What part of the complexity, uh, sorry, part of the complexity here for me is that no one is owning the increased use of prenatal testing and into this gap step commercial actors driving the narrative and rhetoric. That no one is owning, is that the phrase, um, the increase in prenatal? That's an interesting, um... I think you're probably right, actually. It's an interesting way of putting it, um, that it's being seen as a natural development, a natural outcome of um, 
medicine getting better. Um, and we, we can see that it's more um, problematic than that. Um, who needs to be involved uh, in the discussion? Well, you know, in principle, everyone. Um, I think we can see that, we can argue rightly that there are certain players in this who have more, who should have more space at the table than others. And of course, historically, the people who have not had a lot of voice in this have been those people with genetic conditions or disabilities of different kinds um, who have not been part of that conversation. It's very much been something that's uh, been imposed um, as a way of creating normality by people who consider themselves uh, to, be, to be normal. There is um, a debate in bioethics, I think, about um, whether the considerations of um, anybody beyond the, the individual affected, that's the individual affected by a disability or um, a, a genetic condition, particularly prenatally, whether they have they play any role at all or whether the ethics of it is all about the ethics of the effect on that person if they um, survive to grow up. Um, within feminist bioethics, I think, um, and it may be surprising to some people, but uh, there's quite a move to um, say that the considerations of the impact on the mother, considerations on the impact of on the rest of the family, for example, should have a place in the discussion. And that can sometimes be, I think, in the in among disability community, um, quite controversial. Um, I think we legitimately have to say that there are um, health economic considerations that should be taken into account, but. Um, I remain sometimes sceptical about uh, some of the rhetoric that goes with the costings, apparent costings to society of, of there being people with particular kinds of disability around. One can make different kinds of calculations. Um, and I think fundamentally also for me, that raises an issue of the way in which everybody costs money and people coming into the world without detectable um, disability generally don't have to prove that they're sort of worth the money. Um, and when a disability is detected prenatally, that's the kind of argument that then uh, by health economics kind of comes in. And I think that that's ethically uh, a problem. Thank you. Um, so our next question comes from Michael. Uh, he writes, there's frequently a tension between disability rights and reproductive rights in this debate. Uh, he asks, could this be reframed as a tension between transhumanism and ableism? Or I wonder if you could cast it as a tension between, um, you know, feminism, as you were just talking about, and disability activism, or I'm sure there's lots of different ways that you could reframe this, but what do you think? Yeah. Um... I, I actually had a bit uh, in, in the talk originally that, that did go into, um, in fact, it was a final slide that sort of said, how do we make, how do we make this all better? And then mm -hmm. I decided, A, that it was a bit over ambitious and B, I might not have time to go through it in enough detail, but maybe that was unwise. Um, and part of it was, was uh, one point in it was, don't set this up as a tension between women's rights and uh, disability rights. Um, because I think that that is it, that is almost a kind of classic divide and rule, uh, and we're seeing that happening in the U.S. and and elsewhere when it comes to debates about abortion. Um, they're both about some have something to do with control of one's body, and control of and acceptance of particular kinds of embodiment. Um, you know, pragmatically, I think it's always. I, I don't mean always. I mean in all ways bad uh, for a woman to be forced to bear a child that she does not want to bear, whether that's to do with disability or not. Um, the disability argument that many women, most people know very little uh, about disability 
on which they base their judgments about whether or not they can carry this child to term and have a life with it into the future. That that knowledge is lacking. Um, and I think it's getting better because there are certainly more than, say, 50 years ago, many more visibly disabled people in public life, active, working, clearly having um, very good lives uh, in a way that was certainly not the case previously. But um, I think there is still a lot of, as I said, a kind of undercurrent of, um, I think there is both genuine acceptance of the diversity of people and acceptance of people with disability, and at the same time, a subterranean sense of they they would be better off if they weren't like that. And um, I don't believe we've actually faced that tension face on um, yet adequately, because it, I think it is a genuine one. Um, but I don't, at a, on a political level, I don't think it should come into the sort of the politics of, of abortion versus um, disability rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is a bit of a kind of empirical sociological question for you, but you mentioned Iceland, the Netherlands, Denmark. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's a lot of variability around the world in terms of eugenic attitudes um yeah and um sometimes it's it's surprising um sometimes i think it is very it, it it plays out of some very practical realities to do with um the kind of the, the level of supports and so on that will be available for a child and then an adult with disability um inevitably i think that sort of feeds back um into an undercurrent of eugenic thinking about the cost to society, et cetera, and the, the burden, um, the, the sort of not the financial burden, but just the, um, the practical, if you like, burden. And I'm putting burden in quote marks here of disability in society. But there are also, um, I think we have to accept a lot of cultural diversity around the world. And in many places of the world, disability is still seen as something um, shameful. Um, and it's still the case that if a person is, if, if a child is born with a disability, then um, they're they might be hidden away. Um, the, the woman who's given birth to them might be shamed and so on. Um, and those are, you know, that those are places where you know, disability rights have barely got off the ground. So we're, and, and in some ways you can't really talk about that being a eugenic attitude because it is simply not framed in the same sort of quasi-scientific way uh, that it has been in the European, North American, Australian axis. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a sort of follow-up about that? I'm gonna abuse my privileges as chair. Um, which is that uh, I was wondering if it seems like there could be an interesting tension where one of the quotes you gave was from Art Kaplan and he said, in the United States, we might think, well, mm. um, you can have a kid like that if you want to, but I'm not paying for it or something like mm. that. And yeah. so it's almost like it's a very individualistic society it's a very, you know, they don't have universal health care, so there's not really a sense of solidarity or this kind of burdening others. Yeah. So in societies where there is more of a communal sharing, is it more likely that there is a sense that you ought not to be imposing costs on others? Uh, where I might have thought that in those kinds of societies, there would be more of a sense of solidarity and coming together. Mm -hmm. Does it not maybe work like that? Um, I don't know, to be honest. I don't know, have enough social, sort of comparative sociology uh, <laughs> knowledge there. You've seen the, the data that I gave earlier about, you know, Denmark and, and the Netherlands. I mean, they they are brought, they're quite similar countries. They're not obviously mm -hmm. not the same. They have very different histories. But mm -hmm. um, I I don't know enough to say why there is that difference in um, in in the actual uptake of the test um, and what it is in the history, in the culture, that means that um, either women are more reluctant to take up the test or they are more confident that they don't need to. Mm -hmm. And that only those women who are entirely sure that they would terminate 
um, a Down syndrome pregnancy under any circumstances actually take up the test. Um, I and I'm not aware of anybody having done that kind of comparative research yet either. It would be really, really interesting to be funded to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> um, so the next question is, this kind of goes to what you were saying at the end of your talk. Um, given you know what you were talking about, the place of the word eugenics within this, do you think that it's even useful to keep this word? Um, do you think it can be, some people have recently argued that it can be kind of rehabilitated, or do you think that we should pitch it? Yeah, um, I don't think it's possible to rehabilitate it, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I, in some ways, I think it would be useful if, if it could, and we could look at that particular practice um, without knowing the history around it. But then again, it's important to know the history around it because it's important to know where that particular practice can, in certain contexts, lead. I was emphasizing the, the discontinuity in, in historical, social, political context and scientific context too, because I, I wonder whether if it was sort of invented now, um, the outcome, the use of it would be very, very different because um, because the context is so different and we don't have the knowledge of history that so we we wouldn't have that particularly nightmarish association with it. But the truth is that 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 is there and and also um, on a more um, almost pedantic level, I think, you know, the eugenics is about um, preventing the transmission of inherited characteristics. I've seen it used um, in the context of, let's say, um, end of life care for people with disability, voluntary assisted dying, that kind of thing. Eugenics is kind of irrelevant there because it's not about reproduction. And you know, I think it, some people might legitimately turn to me and say that is really splitting hairs in a situation <laughs> of, of you know, acute crisis and an emergency. But I don't think it is. I think it's important to be clear uh, as clear as one can be exactly what it is you're talking about. And just because eugenics comes loaded with the whole, as I said, almost nightmarish sense associated with it, doesn't mean that the word discrimination or disabilism isn't just as bad. We don't have to kind of up the ante and say this is genocide to point to something and say this is actually really bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Jackie. That brings us to the end of this um, final chapter of A Past Still Present, Disability Discrimination and Eugenics from the Nazi Third Reich to COVID-19. Um, you can learn more and subscribe to the Disability Innovation Institute at disabilityinnovation.unsw.edu.au. It's been my pleasure to share this event. Thank you everyone for joining and for your excellent questions. And thank you so much, Professor Skelly, for a very invigorating talk. Thanks everyone and have a great afternoon. Bye.